We are excited to welcome Kathleen Dellett um, as our first presenter today. Kathleen will be presenting on tillage and residue management in organic systems, focus on weeds and soil quality. Um, her background is um, a PhD in agroecology from UC Berkeley. She worked with um, Miguel Altieri in an entomology project there. Um, she holds the first tenure track faculty position in organic agriculture in the US. And she's currently a professor in organic agriculture at um, Iowa State University in the departments of agronomy and horticulture since 1998. Um, she conducts research and teaches and also does extension in organic grains and fruits and vegetables. So quite a, quite a wealth, of, wealth of knowledge and we're really excited to have her here with us. A brief housekeeping note uh, that we will be taking questions at the end. Um, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. You may click that and type your question in any time. And um, Kathleen will uh, entertain those questions at the end of her presentation. We, will, uh, we need to end promptly at 3.20 today, central time, um, so that Kathleen can get to a meeting. Um, but with that, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And thanks to Kathleen for, for presenting. And we'll turn it over to you, Kathleen. OK. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, I'd like to present some of our research on uh, weeds and soil quality and acknowledging my co-author, Cynthia Cambardella from USDA ARS here in Ames, Iowa, our soil scientists on these projects. So let's get started. So just a little snapshot for those of you online that aren't familiar with organic statistics. In 92, 1992, there was less than a million acres of organic, and then the last census by USDA, there were five million acres of organic production. Just looking at grains, about 214,000 acres in 95, and four times as much at the, as at the last census in 2016, with a $383 million value. Now, the total U.S. Um, industry sales in organic totaled 50 billion last year, and Organic continues to grow at an 8% annual rate. So why Iowa? Iowa actually is one of the leaders in organic production in the US. It has the seventh largest number of organic farms in the US. And if you look at this map, it's an old map from USDA, but the colors still pretty much hold true. So the darker colored states are where we have the highest numbers of organic uh, farms in the country. So looking at this uh, graph from USDA NAS, chart, you can see that Iowa is in the top 10 as far as the amount of sales um, in, from organic products, bringing in 103 million. That was in 2014, last time they made this graph. So moving on to our research, um, we believe, I'm going to try to move my thing here. We believe that the enhancement of soil quality is at the heart of organic re regulations. And so our research, we call it In Search of the Holy Grail. Well, we're looking at maintaining soil quality while managing weeds, because contrary to what we would hope, uh, tillage is still the most common method for managing weeds on organic farms. But on all organic farms, they're required to have these crop rotations, cover crops, most are using compost, and that mitigates the effects of tillage, as I'll show you in some of our data. So here's some shots of organic farmers with cover crops and turning compost piles, all feeding the soil food web. Oops, sorry. So we also are looking at other added benefits from organic production, such as environmental ecosystem services. So we're looking at the maintenance of soil quality and renewal of soil fertility. We're also looking at water quality, carbon sequestration, and biological control of agricultural pests. Today, I'm only going to be presenting on a uh, majority of the time on soil quality and weed management. But I have one slide here on our water quality research that we're conducting with USDA ARS here in Ames, Iowa. And this shows that in the different rotations, organic corn, soybean, oats, alfalfa, alfalfa, versus conventional corn, soybean, or organic pasture, 
you can see how much nitrate, nitrogen was lost um, in the tiles. Every one of these plots is underlaid with tiles that collect the nitrates. And just looking at this year, 3% of applied nitrogen was lost in the organic compared to 12% in the conventional. So over the years, Dr. Campadella has concluded that the nitrate loss is reduced by 57% under the organic rotations compared to conventional. And this research was published in the journal called Sustainable Ag Research in 2015. I like this slide from Kate Scout at UC Davis where we're looking at different metrics to determine sustainability in our research. We're looking at the long-term trends in yield, we're looking at profitability, we're looking at efficiency and use of natural resources, in our case water, we'd like to get into an energy analysis in the future. Environmental impact, we're looking at nitrate leaching right now and it'd be good to look at pesticides in the future too. So the site I'm going to focus on today is the ISU Neely Kenyon LTAR site. That stands for Long-Term Agroecological Research. And last year was the 21st year comparing organic and conventional crops in this system. And you can see an overview of the plots here. We have 44 plots with four rotations and five crops in those rotations. And they're quarter acre plots each, so they're run like regular agronomic systems with traditional um, equipment that, far, that a farmer would use in the area. And this research was supported by the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture. So the farmers decided the tr initial treatments and they provide input on our results. So we tweak it annually based on their suggestions. Our main comparison is the uh, conventional corn soybean versus the longer organic rotations that contain small grains and legumes. The site is certified organic, or certified in the third year by the Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship. And when possible, the crops are sold as certified organic. That's showing a field day where we update with local organic farmers and marketers. So this is a schemata of the um, layout of the experimental design. We can see corn soybean conventional rotation, <coughs> excuse me, versus um, the organic corn soybean oat alfalfa three year rotation. So the um, next one is the corn soybean oat alfalfa alfalfa rotation. And then finally our newest rotation is corn soybean corn oat alfalfa because um, with farmers getting more money from the organic corn. Some requested a study where we've had a more intensive rotation with more corn in the rotation. So I'll show you some of the effects from that. So it's a systems approach we're using at this site. So we're looking at a lot of parameters. As I mentioned today, we're gonna to focus on yields, weeds, and soil quality, which involves chemical, biological, and physical properties. We're using certified organic practices at the site, so only naturally based inputs, crop rotations, minimum three crops, soil building compost and legumes. The composted manure is applied on the corn crop every third or fourth year of the rotation, depending on the rotation. And Dr. Campbell estimates that provides about 80 to 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre, depending on the compost that year. The compost is treated as raw manure and put on at least three months before harvest. In general, we're putting it on in March when the soils are warm. Originally, we were using um, hoop house swine manure, shown here in the picture, but when that system was discontinued, we then are purchasing our manure from a commercial chicken facility. And while that's not ideal, it is allowed in organic as long as you follow the manure rules. And we are concerned, as always, about phosphorus buildup. So far, we've not had it become a problem, but we do check every year for that. Okay, on to weed management. We're using preventive measures, including cover crops, especially rye for its allelopathic properties. The long-term crop rotations, oats and alfalfa can help, uh, both through their tillering ability and some allelopathy. And then we're using mechanical practices, cultivators, rotary hose, and we're managing the weeds when they're first emerging. That's called the white thread stage. And at appropriate intervals, 
to prevent establishment and weed seed production. We have occasionally pulled out the flame weeder, shown here in the bottom right, uh, when the soils are too wet for the cultivator. So looking at soybeans specifically, we're using a high planting rate, 175,000 to 220,000 seeds per acre. And that solid cover of the small grain crop and alfalfa that follow the soybeans are very important in, rotation, in the rotation for weed management. After corn, we're planting a cover crop of rye to, um, before the soybeans. That really helps with the allelopathic response there. And then we'll use a high cultivator, high residue cultivator between the rows. We strive for only two passes, two to three maximum passes to avoid as much tillage as possible. Inevitably, we'll be walking soybeans as most organic farmers do, especially for any staining weeds like nightshade that could downgrade the quality of the soybean. So looking at yields, we've been able to achieve statistically equivalent conventional and organic corn and soybean yields at the Altar site as shown here. But you can see even though there was no statistical difference, you do get a numerical bump in yield when you have that second year of alfalfa in your rotation. Now, it's not necessarily predicated on having higher nitrogen in the organic system, because you can see here that the yields were the same despite lower nitrogen at the late spring nitrate testing in the organic system. And we believe this is due to the slow release manure fertilizers we're using. Soybeans have been equivalent throughout the whole experiment, averaging about 50 bushels an acre, no difference between conventional and organic, and no difference between the three and four year rotation because they fix their own nitrogen. Alfalfa, the average yield at the Altar has been four tons per acre, and the county average is three and a half tons, so we get excellent alfalfa yields at that site. Now, moving on to comparisons between yields and weeds, um, Josh Posner did a great study in 2008 that was published in the Agronomy Journal, where he looked at different long-term sites around the country and where specifically uh, researchers were comparing organic and conventional corn and soybean. And he rated their weed control, and then he looked at how that corresponded to their yields. So just looking at an example here, in Pennsylvania, I believe that was Rodale's site. Uh, you can see where they had poor weed control, their corn yield was only 84% of the conventional yield. While when they had good weed control, it was 112% of the conventional. And moving to Iowa, which I didn't even know he was evaluating us, but I'm glad he rated us as having good weed management. And um, our corn, therefore, our organic corn, therefore, was 114% of the conventional and the soybean was 111%. So that pattern held throughout the country. Um, it's interesting to note that the small grains, wheat and oats, wheat here, were all very high, 90 to 100% of the conventional because of that tillering property, I think, that helps um, mitigate weeds in the small grain fields. And then Janet Headkey from UW Madison, who worked on this, who works on this long-term site, and she worked on the project with Josh, Josh Posner. They did a further comparison of looking at weeds during normal springs and wet springs, and came up with um, some really interesting results. So we looked at two sites, two research farms, and just looking at in normal springs. You can see there, there were 96 percent, the organic was 96 percent of conventional at, at one site and 94 at another, compared to when there was wet springs, 72 to 76 percent of conventional. So we'll talk about the reasons behind that, but that could be a huge detriment when you go into the year with a wet spring. So looking at our uh, weed and yield population specifically at the Altar site. You can see that, of course, with the use of herbicides, the weed populations are much lower in the conventional rotation. Remember, yields are significantly similar among the treatments. But in the organic, 
we also see no significant difference in grass weeds and broadleaves, but when you look at the numbers, you can see that there's higher, there were numerically higher numbers in the organic rotations compared to the conventional. Same with the soybeans, no statistical difference in yield, no statistical difference in weed populations. However, when you look at and dig down into it, you can see higher numbers in the organic rotations compared to the conventional, where herbicides were used, no herbicides in the organic. It's also interesting to note numerical differences in the rotation that has, we call it the corn intensive rotation, corn, soybean, corn, oat alfalfa, had a hot, numerically higher numbers of grass weeds compared to the other organic rotations. So then we started examining the ratio of broadleaf to grass weeds, and a lot of this had to do with tracking herbicide resistance in the conventional rotations, which we're seeing more and more of. So just looking at the difference here, you can see in the conventional rotations, the uh, average ratio of broadleaves to grass weeds was 3.5 in corn, 2.8 in soybean, compared to 1.1 in the four-year rotation um, and 0 0.03 in soybean. So there was a higher ratio of broadleaves to grasses in the conventional rotation and higher numbers down here in the organic corn, the organic intensive, or sorry, the corn intensive organic rotation, organic corn, soybean corn, versus the longer rotations. So why more weeds in the last five years? Multiple reasons, but we are seeing, as I mentioned, herbicide resistance in the conventional plots. There's also tell that the herbicides aren't working as well. We have seen with global climate change that we are getting wetter springs and summers, early summers, droughts in midsummer is what we're seeing more and more of, basically leading to fewer days for weed management. And then on top of that, you have poor stands, poor crop stands from the cool, wet springs. So we do see higher populations of these um, herbicide resistant weeds showing up in the conventional sprayed fields and more and more I think there's a lot of interest on the conventional side to look at integrated west uh, integrated weed management obtain lessons from organic farmers. Speaking of organic farmers this is one of our premier organic farmers Ron Roseman Harlan Iowa what we dream of our soybeans looking like and in this case, Ron uses ridge tillage, and he rarely walks his soybeans just through his uh, cultivator, rotary hoeing and cultivating. He's able to manage the weeds, or the, able to manage the weeds so the soybeans end up looking like that. Now I mentioned we're taking soil data every year. Dr. Camberdella will soil sample every fall in each plot, and she's um, taking five randomly located soil cores, zero to 15 centimeters. She takes them after harvest, but before any tillage that we, put down, that we use for cover crop planting. So looking at some of her soils data, she's shown that carbon sequestration is higher in the organic plots, the two organic treatments shown on the right there. She's also shown that total nitrogen or nitrogen storage in the soil for the next crop is greater in the organic plots. Beneficial soil microbial populations are always greater in the organic plots, shown here. And she's showing more calcium in the organic plots. So as a result of that, the soils are becoming less acidic in the organic fields. And you can see that in the pH, the differences in the pH between the conventional and organic rotations. Aggregate stability, um, not much difference between the three-year rotation and conventional, but much higher in the longer-term four-year rotation. Leading Dr. Camberdell to conclude that despite tillage in the organic systems, soil quality enhancement was particularly evident for label soil carbon and nitrogen pools, which are critical for maintenance of nitrogen fertility and for basic cation concentrations, which control nutrient availability through the relationship with cation exchange capacity. And then despite serious droughts, 
organic management enhanced agroecosystem resilience and maintained a critical soil function, and that is the capacity of the soil to supply nutrients to the crops. Now, with all these practices, are we making any money? Yes, we are working with uh, Dr. Craig Chase at Iowa State University, and he um, compiles this every year, looking at all the costs of production between the conventional and organic systems. And on average, they're about $100 less in the organic systems compared to the conventional. So this is, for example, comparing the cost of production in the corn, conventional corn soybean rotation versus costs in the organic corn soybean oat alfalfa alfalfa rotation. And what about returns? They are actually um, much higher, sometimes two to three times higher in the organic system. Um, here are the, some differences between the corn crop, soybean crop, conventional and organic, and then over the entire rotation. So this is just corn soybean here, but this is corn, soybean, oats, and alfalfa returns. And you can see that they're about three times as high in the organic rotation. In this case, 3.5% higher. And basically seeing no significant difference between the three and four year rotation, which is good news for a lot of organic farmers in Iowa that do not have livestock, so they don't need that extra year of alfalfa. However, it is more beneficial for your soil to have that extra year of alfalfa in there, and we think it does help with uh, weed management too. So Dr. Chase has shown that organic premium prices help bolster economic returns for organic systems, but even during transition, returns were not significantly lower due to those lower costs of production. You're not having any fertilizers or um, synthetic pesticides out there, so you're gonna have lower costs of production. So that's our LTAR data. Now I wanna to turn to our organic no-till research that we've been doing since uh, 2005. And we're looking at organic no-till both for weed management and soil quality enhancement. We've looked at hairy vetch before corn, rye before soybean, and then a combo of hairy vetch and rye before veg organic vegetables. And in this system, the cover crops are planted in the fall, and then they're crushed in the spring with a roller crimper, shown here in this picture. The ideal system is having the roller crimper in the front with the planter in the rear. However, you can also put the uh, roller crimper in the rear of the tractor and plant in a separate pass. Uh, Aaron Silva and I wrote a paper in 2017 in the journal Agriculture, summarizing a lot of uh, organic no-till research in the Midwest. Aaron's done a lot at UW-Madison, so if you're interested in that, there's a citation for that. So Rodale um, gave us this roller crimper in 2005 and we've been using it since. And they surmise that the potential benefits of organic no-till include, include decreasing soil erosion, decreasing your weed management and your weed management costs, decreasing petroleum use. Michigan State has shown 90% lower fuel use with organic no-till soybeans. Madison has shown 50% less. And when you have a normal rainfall year, you can conserve moisture in the soil with that mulch layer. So there's a close-up of those fluted cultures that cut through the crushed cover crop residue to enable the um, pass for the seeds. Some pictures of our research, um, as I mentioned, the soybeans following rye, that works really well, especially when the weather cooperates. Um, when you have even rains throughout the, se the season with no drought is, is when we've had the best yields. Corn has not been that successful for us, but we're not giving up on it. Um, here it is no-tilled into rolled hairy vetch, and the issue there is that the hairy vetch will continue to grow, regrow after it's crushed. So we're looking at, we're gonna look at different ways to terminate that, including flaming, for example. Uh, vegetables, we've had a lot of luck with them. We found that 
a compost side dress will actually inc increase yields even after the rolled cover crops. So we're recommending that practice. We did try some no-till oats, but we had a lot of problems with volunteer rye in that system. So we're not recommending it at this time. As I mentioned, we were able in a good year with, with good rains, like this year, 2009, to get equivalent yields between organic tilled system versus organic no-tilled. So these are both organic systems. And you can see the yields there, 37 in the no-till versus 43. That's a great yield if you can get 37 bushels an acre without any weed management, we'll take that. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen like that every year. Um, I have a video on this system, our organic natural system, on the Organic Center website. So there's the URL there if you want to go and look at the 10-minute um, video on how we did this system. As I mentioned, we worked with Cindy Kimberdell and also Sharon Wires, a soil scientist at USDA ARS in Morris, Minnesota. And they found consistently greater soil quality in the organic no-till system. So again, the conventional till on here is actually organic conventional till. So it's using the typical tillage practices we talked about, rotary hoeing and row cultivation, compared to the no-till. And this research covered six states. And you can see wherever it's highlighted in yellow, that means it was significantly greater in the organic no-till system, microbial biomass, microbial or microbial biomass carbon and microbial biomass nitrogen, which are great indicators of soil quality. And there was only one site that had equal microbial biomass nitrogen um, in comparing to in conventional and no-till systems. So I, I call this slide, Why We Dream of Organic No-Till Working. This is from Emily Bernstein's article in the Agronomy Journal also from UW-Madison. And Emily put her data through the Russell II, Revised Universal Soil Loss Equation. And she showed that in the organic tilt system, on a 1% slope, you were getting 10.9 megagrams per hectare of soil loss. And the Russell equation said the tolerable, tolerated soil loss was 11 megagrams per hectare, so the difference, you're, you're, you're surviving there with tolerable soil loss. But if you move to a 4.5% slope, which we never do recommend tilling on a slope that large, um, you, you could get up to 49 megagrams per hectare soil loss. Um, so it'd be negative 38.3 over tolerable soil loss. Not very good for a sustainable farm. But when you move to an organic no-till system, on a 1% slope, your loss is reduced down to 1.5 megagrams per hectare. So you're actually above what the tolerated, tolerable um, soil loss would be, according to Russell too. Now, moving to a higher slope, yes, you're gonna have higher soil loss, but still, you're within that range of tolerated soil loss in the organic no-till system. And then Emily also looked at changes in soil organic matter. She used NRCS's soil conditioning index and she showed similar results that oops, when you go up the slope, you're going to increase your erosion and also decrease the potential for building soil organic matter. So in the soil conditioning index, which ranged from negative two to plus two, in the organic tilled on a 1% slope it was 0 0.9, negative 0 0.9, but at 4.5%, it was greater than negative two. Compared to when you're using organic no-till, you're gaining soil organic matter, uh, plus 0 0.4 on a 1% slope, and plus 0 0.3 on a 4.5% slope. So this is what drives us to continue to work on organic no-till. Um, we've shown through our data that organic sites show greater soil quality than conventional. We've shown higher profitability and equal yields with our integrated weed management system. And it is a systems approach. We're using crop rotations, cover crops for their allelopathic properties 
and timely, limited tillage operations. The ecological principle of diversity equals stability holds here in that the longer rotations with the perennials do provide greater yield stability and help reduce weed pressure. We're saying organic no-till works well, works best with the rye preceding the soybeans and rye hairy batch with vegetables. This year, thanks to a USDA conservation integration grant with UW-Madison and Rodale Institute, We'll be testing the Rodale roller crimper and also a Dawn roller crimper and a True Flex roller. So comparing different rollers, roller crimpers, ways to terminate that cover crop will be part of this grant. Finally, though, I want to say that we do believe livestock integration is essential in an organic, organic system. Um, a lot of farmers are not maintaining livestock on the farm anymore, but I think the ones that have livestock tend to be more of an integrated, sustainable system. We have a current USDA NEFA project investigating the effect of rotationally grazing pasture and small grain pastures, that is wheat and rye, and then we'll follow it the next year with corn and soybeans, and this is in three states, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, and Iowa, and we've shown that to be a successful system cattle shown here grazing rye cover crop in Minnesota. And the following year, that pasture was rotated to uh, corn and soybeans and they had excellent yields there. And so far, the soil quality results are coming in that we're not uh, decreasing soil quality any in the system and maybe adding a little bit more nitrogen or enzymes related to nit nitrogen cycling in the systems where cattle have grazed. So thank you for your interest, and here's my contact info. If there's any questions, I can take them now in the Q&A box. Thank you. Tom says, is there generally a challenge with demonstrating significant differences with weed control, but numeric differences with large surprise no significance? Well, actually, Tom, we're, we are striving for obtaining no difference in weed populations between conventional and organic because that's what farmers consider the most important constraint for organic production is managing weeds. So if we can show that, yes, numerically there's higher weeds where you don't use herbicides, but still they're not, they're statistically similar to the um, conventional rotations, then farmers are happy with that data. Brian, if the costs of production are lower for organic corn, soybeans, and conventional, and returns are higher, why? Don't more farmers transition to organic? Good question, Ryan. What I've been asking for the last 20 years here. And it ebbs and flows. Right now, my phone's ringing off the hook because commodity prices, conventional corn soybeans are so low. Um, I think I read it's now the fifth year where returns are in the negative for conventional crops in Iowa. So I'm getting more interest now in transitioning to organic. I have about seven farmers taking my organic class tonight that are interested in transitioning. And um, that's in a classroom with 35 students here on campus. So uh, we're, we're, see we're seeing a bit more interest and I think it does definitely correlates with decreasing conventional crops. Um, as I told my class too, because my class asked me that question, it, it's just easy to take your crops down to the local elevator the way you've done all your life, and also maybe bring in your local co-op to do your spraying for you. So it's just, it'd be breaking tradition for them to get into organic, but like I said, I see a lot more interest these days. I'm really heartened by that. With all the benefits you found, any thoughts on barriers to transition, how to overcome them? I think just, they're, it's just breaking that mindset. Um, and there, it is a learning curve. Uh, not everybody can have fields like Ron Roseman's the first year they transition to organic. So I think having mentors or um, farmer neighbors, I, I always pair someone with a, an experienced organic farmer when I encourage them to transition to organic. So I think that can really help too. Okay, so Tom. Do you do consulting with food companies, large farms, and other states, general mills, converting large acreage to organic? If yes, can you talk about what's happening in that arena? 
Well, ironically, Tom, I've gotten two calls from large companies this semester so far. It's only the second month of the semester. And what I do with them, I actually, Craig Chase, the economist, and I do what we call the dog and pony show, where we'll do a Zoom conference with them, like we're doing here at Zoom. And we go over some of our research, not all of it, but just showing the highlights and saying, okay, this is what it's going to take, but you have to have bonafide, devoted, organic manager that's going to, going to want to follow all these practices to actually get it through the level to transition it to organic. We can help you, but we can't be there doing the management ourselves. So um, we pretty much do a two-part free series with them, encourage them to come to Moses Conference or I, our Iowa Organic Conference in November. Um, they can take our class, and then it's up to them to make the next step. A couple of them last year were thinking about offering contracts to us. I really don't have time to get involved in a contract. Um, if I was an independent, I, I certainly would consider that. Um, but to date, we've just offered free Zoom conferences and encourage them to come to our classes and workshops that are available to anyone here at Iowa State. But yeah, I'm seeing more interest in that too, with larger companies. And this year, some of you on the line may know about, I could actually um, post it through the listserv, that Pipeline Foods, the large company in Minneapolis, they and um, I believe Sustainable Food Labs are co-sponsoring some transitioning to organic trainings around the country. One's coming up in North Dakota really soon, I think in March. And we will have ours with Wisconsin and Minnesota in August because we want to take them on an organic farm that's in production at the time. So um, I'll send around information about that training too. So we're seeing more interest from companies supporting trainings in transition too. Well, feel free to email me if you have any questions or comments. Um, I mentioned to Allie that I hope to be able to participate more in the group this year because um, I'm getting some additional assistance in my lab, so that should free me up a little to get be able to get back with this group. Um, Tom says, could you briefly run through the nitrogen loss differences in tile drain systems? What's responsible for the loss reduction in organic? Is it application rate and form? Good question, Tom. I would say a combination. Um, these, and again, I'm, I'm speculating based on Dr. Camberdella's data. Unfortunately, she couldn't be with us today, but um, she's saying, yes, it's the system effect of having that longer rotation, having those deep roots of the oats in the system to take up the nitrogen following the corn and soybeans. And then, um, also I'm gonna shift it. <laughs> or did you move the camera? Um, and then, yes, we're, losing, we're using a lower rate She's saying 80 to 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre versus in the conventional system, they're putting on up to 150 pounds. It's supposed to be equivalent between the two systems, but um, we don't always get it exact. And um, so having the lower rate of nitrogen, having the alfalfa in the system, adding nitrogen to the system without relying on fertilizers, we're using just compost and manure and the cover crops to provide the nitrogen. And those are a much slower release type of material um, compared to synthetic nitrogen, which is rapidly mobile. So all those factors added together lead to lower nitrate leaching into the tile tiles in the organic system compared to the conventional. What are you thinking, Allie? Are you, do you want to close those questions? Just have people email if they have any more. Yeah, that, that sounds like a, a good plan. And, and again, thank you so much, Kathleen, for sharing your, your work. And we'll, we'll keep tabs on your, uh, the results of your latest grants, grant. Congratulations on that. Um, and look forward to having you be as involved in the group as you can be. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Have a good week, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye.